Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new lecture of our course on heterogeneous systems. Today, we are going to talk about another parallel pattern, graph search. We are going to discuss different possible implementations of graph processing algorithms on GPUs. Before that, let's very quickly recap on the parallel patterns that we have covered so far. We started with the reduction, an operation that reduces a set of values to a single value using an operator that is associative, commutative, and has an identity value. And we discussed how to come up with a free a divergence free mapping that uh, increases the, the utilization of uh, the warps. Later, we talk about uh, histogram computation, a way of reducing the dimensionality and extracting notable features in large data sets. Remember that in uh, histogram computation, what we do is going over, going over the uh, elements of an input array and creating an output array that contains the count of each of the possible values in the input array. Remember as well that if we uh, implement a parallel histogram, we'll have to use atomic operations in order to avoid uh, data races. The problem with atomic operations, as you may remember, is that they serialize the execution. But we also discussed some uh, possible optimizations to alleviate uh, this, the overhead of this serialization, for example, privatization. After that, we talk about convolution, a very widely used um, uh, primitive these days, especially using convolutional neural networks, for example. Remember that what we do in convolution is applying a filter or a kernel uh, or mask on the elements of an input array in order to obtain the elements of the output array by doing a weighted sum. This is an example of a 1D convolution. We also talk about the 2D convolution, and we also talk about how to convert a convolutional layer into a matrix multiplication in order to uh, get the most of uh, GPUs. Uh, remember that the next parallel pattern was uh, prefix sum, an operation that takes an input array and an associative operator and returns an output array that is the result of recursively applying the associative operator on the elements of the input array. We discussed different implementations, for example, this one, the scan, scan, add. Uh, version or the reduced scan scan version that we also discussed that could be uh, more more efficient uh, on GPUs at the scan scan add version and remember as well that we talk about the cohiston parallel scan algorithm that we use at the warp level and at the thread block level. In our previous lecture, we talk about the sparse matrices and we talk about the, the sparse matrix vector multiplication. Remember that a sparse matrix is a matrix where most of the elements are zero. These represent some opportunities to save um, storage and to save uh, the accesses to memory and to save computation. Remember as well that we discuss implementations of uh, SPMB using different compression formats. And one of the uh, most widely used compression formats is the compressed sparse row uh, or CSR uh, that we are going to uh, remind also today because it's um, the default uh, compressed format, compression format that we are going to use for uh, our graphs as well. So let's just start talking about uh, graph search. But before that, let's talk about dynamic data extraction. This is uh, something that we are going to have whenever the data that needs to be processed in each phase of computation is dynamically determined and extracted from a bulk data structure. Uh, this is uh, harder when the, the bulk data structure is not organized in a regular manner, such as, for example, graphs. Graph algorithms are popular examples that perform dynamic data extraction, and they are used in many different fields. For example, we will talk today about uh, uh, um, electronic design uh, automation. The uh, algorithm that we are going to use at the example is a widely used breadth for search or BFS. Dynamic data extraction poses uh, important challenges. Uh, first, because the input data needs to be organized for locality, coalescing, and contention avoidance as they are extracted uh, during the execution. And also another important challenge is that the amount of work and level of parallelism often, often grow and shrink during execution. So we need to create our kernel with different strategies in order to adapt to the amount of data and the amount of work that needs to be done in each um, iteration. This is like a very good fit for something that we will cover in a later lecture that is uh, dynamic parallelism that exists uh, in CUDA since the Kepler architecture. Uh, but today we are going to, um, let's say, talk about the traditional approach. We will talk about the dynamic parallelism approaching 
uh, a few lectures. Graphs and matrices, sparse matrices are closely related. This uh, on the left-hand side of the slide is, uh, let's say the logical representation of a graph where you can identify different nodes or vertices and also the edges that connect these nodes to other nodes. Um, let's say that the way that we're going to use to represent this graph in memory is uh, through the use of what we call the adjacency matrix. Observe that in the adjacency matrix, we are going to have uh, one uh, element different from zero uh, in the corresponding pos in the position uh, that represents the edge that goes from one source node to one destination node. For example, here we have a, um, um, an edge that goes from vertex zero to vertex one, and that's why we have one in this position of the adjacency matrix. And same for the edge zero to two, that's why we have one in this position of the adjacency matrix. One thing that you have observed here, we have to observe here is that this uh, graph that we are uh, using as an example has directional uh, edges or unidirectional edges. That means that it's only possible to go from um, vertex zero to vertex one. We could have as well bidirectional edges, uh, meaning that we could also go from uh, node one to node zero. But indeed, in that case, we would also have one in this uh, cell of the uh, adjacency matrix because the source would be uh, one and the um, destination would be node zero. So this is the adjacency matrix. Another uh, important uh, consideration here is that observe that all non-zero elements are equal to one and that's why these are not weighted edges. Uh, we can find uh, graphs where these edges have a certain weight and this weight is different. For different edges, in that case, we would have those values uh, in the adjacency matrix. Uh, sparse matrices are widespread today. And remember that this is a, a slide that we showed in the previous lecture. They are uh, widespread today because they are used in many graph processing applications, such as, for example, these graph analytics applications or graph neural networks. Remember as well that we talk about the compressed sparse row uh, uh, compression format uh, or representation in order to store um, sparse matrices in an efficient manner. What we did was uh, getting rid of the zero elements in the original matrix and just uh, keeping uh, uh, pointers to the rows, to the start of the rows, such that we only need to uh, store the column indices of the non-zero elements and, and the non-zero elements themselves. So that's how we are going to also store in memory the compressed representation of our example graph. So we need to have a, an array of row pointers that we are going to call the source array because it represents each of the um, individual vertices this uh, element here represents vertex zero, vertex one, vertex two, vertex three, and so on. And then we have a, a, an array of column indices that is the destination. So where the edges uh, finish. So for example, for node zero, we have edges to node one and node two. So from node zero, we go to edge one and node two. And for node, node two, we can go to uh, edges uh, we can go to uh, other vertices uh, five, six, and seven, and that's also uh, what we uh, can see uh, here. So for example, node two would be here. So uh, it's uh, five, six, and seven, as you can see. And then we also have uh, a non the non-zero elements or the data array that in this case, because in this, uh, um, in this graph, we don't have weighted edges, all elements of the array of non-zero elements are equal to one. So in principle, we can, for this particular example, we can get rid of this uh, whole array because all elements are equal to one. But let's start talking about breadth first search or BFS. It's an algorithm that is used to determine the minimal number of hops that is required to go from a source node to a destination node or all destinations. This is, for example, the desirable outcome when we take a node zero as the source node. Observe that for each of the different uh, vertices in the graph other than vertex zero, uh, we mark them with the distance that we have to um, the source vertex, in this case, vertex zero. So vertex one is a distance one, vertex three is a distance two, or vertex eight is a distance uh, three. 
So let's see how we come up with this uh, desirable outcome. Uh, one thing that uh, we will have to do is uh, performing this uh, search in, iter in, in, in multiple iterations. We start with the uh, source node, and then we are going to identify what are the destination uh, vertices that we can reach with one hop, uh, two hops, three hops, uh, etc. In the beginning, in the initial condition, we have the distance is minus one or is um, infinity, uh, whatever you prefer, to uh, each of the uh, destination vertices. So we start from this um, initial condition, and in the first iteration, with one hop, we obtain the first frontier that are those nodes that are reachable with a single hop. And in this case, are the closest neighbors or the neighbors of node zero that are node one and node two. So these two nodes represent the first frontier uh, of the uh, breadth first search algorithm of the first iteration. In the second iteration, we obtain the second frontier. We go to the neighbors of the vertices that belong to the first frontier, that is nodes Z one and two, and we uh, keep track of the neighbors of these two, which are node three and four are neighbors of uh, vertex one, and um, five, six, and seven are neighbors of vertex two. So this creates our second frontier. In the third frontier, uh, we visit the neighbors of the of this green frontier of the second frontier, and in this case, we only have uh, in the output frontier and the third frontier, we only have this node A. But this is our desirable outcome. If we had a much larger graph, we would repeat the same uh, way of operating the same uh, iterations uh, over time. The solution is going to be different if we have a different source node. For example, in this case node two is the source. So uh, the desired output for node two is uh, something like this. In the first frontier, we have the neighbors of node two that are nodes five, six, and seven. In second frontier, we have the neighbors of five, six, and seven that are nodes zero and eight, and so on. And now let's see how we have to go through the data structures, the compressed uh, sparse array representation of the graph that we have in memory every time that we uh, process one frontier. In this uh, particular example, we are taking the second frontier for node two that we have seen in this slide. So uh, this is our current frontier with nodes um, uh, zero and eight. Uh, what we have to do first is go into the uh, source array in order to see what are uh, what are the uh, let's say limits of the um, neighbors of each of the nodes of these source nodes uh, in the array of destinations so for node zero we have to go until element two of the destination array for node a we would start in element 15 and we will also finish in element 15. What, means that, what that means is that um, node A doesn't have any neighbors and that's what we actually can see here uh, in the graph. But for node zero, we have to visit these two neighbors. The neighbors of node zero are nodes one and two, nodes one and two, as you can see in the graph. And after that, we have to go to a new array that is the label array that actually contains what's the distance from the source node to the um, specific destination node. In this case, destination one in principle has not been visited yet. Uh, destination two is not zero. I, and it, it's a, it, destination two is the, the actually the, the, the own source node two. So it has already been visited and it's at distance zero. So what we uh, see, what we do here is replacing in the label array uh, the uh, corresponding label or corresponding distance in this case for the destination node one with the actual distance that we can uh, calculate from the uh, previous frontier. In this case, it's uh, node one is a distance three of node two. So this is more or less how BFS works. And BFS, as I said in the beginning, is widely used in many different applications, for example, in um, computer-aided design for maze routing, for example, if you have um, something like um, 
this uh, PCB design where there are already some wires that have been um, uh, some, some, uh, yeah, some wires that are, have already been uh, printed and um, they represent a blockage. So if we want to connect two net, terminal, net terminals like these uh, red dots, what we want to um, find is the uh, fastest way from uh, going from one net terminal to the other net terminal. And one way of doing so is by uh, characterizing what's the distance, obtaining what's the distance from one node to all other nodes uh, in the system, um, including in the graph, including uh, this way, this one. And this way, we can find the closest or the shortest connection between these two node terminals, net terminals. And this is just a one example of um, how to use uh, BFS. Now we are going to discuss different ways of implementing BFS on parallel architectures and GPUs. But one thing that I would like to say upfront before going into the different implementations that we are going to discuss, because it's one consideration we are going to uh, take into account when uh, discussing and presenting these different implementations is that uh, uh, we have to be careful with uh, the, how we design the algorithms, because depending on the amount of computation, we are going to have more or less complexity. And, uh, one thing that um, to take into account is that uh, n-square algorithms are going to be significantly slower than n, uh, so O n algorithms or O n log n algorithms when the size of the problem becomes very large. As you can see here in this plot, um, these uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, green this black line represents a function that is uh, has a complexity of uh, n square while the dash uh, line represents uh, n logging uh, an n logging problem right and we can see how the running time uh, of the n square problem is uh, actually uh, smaller than that of the uh, n logging algorithm but at some point as the problem increases uh, we see that it's uh, exactly the other way around. So that's an important consideration to take into account when designing algorithms and when analyzing the efficiency of these algorithms. But let's start with the algorithms. The first one is what we call the node-oriented parallelization. In this case, what we are, what we are going to do, imagine that this is um, uh, the, the uh, sparse representation of the um, uh, of the graph, actually, this would be like the um, uh, row pointers array that represents uh, the source nodes. Uh, what we are going to do is uh, each thread uh, is dedicate one thread to each node. And uh, what we do is for, um, uh, all, so all nodes are going to be visited in all iterations. And in each iteration, every thread examines if the neighbor, neighbor nodes of the assigned node um, are going to be in the frontier of the next phase. So, for example, um, if this is the current frontier, five, six, and seven, and we assign one thread to each of these uh, nodes, we will have to see what are these nodes are actually frontier right now and uh, mark their neighbors as the, uh, as, as the, the, the um, nodes in the uh, next frontier. The problem with this is that we are assigning uh, threads to all these um, source nodes, and uh, this um, makes us, uh, uh, like, uh, let's say, visit or, or uh, uh, inspect some nodes that are not really in the current frontier. So the problem with this implementation is that the complexity is uh, OVL plus E, because we visit all nodes and all potential edges on potentially all edges in all uh, levels of the uh, so actually sorry it's uh, we visit all vertices in all levels in all iterations uh, plus e that is the um, uh, number of edges that are the actual neighbors that we are visiting in each iteration and this complexity is going to be significantly higher than the desirable complexity of o b plus e um, um, yeah, because we have to visit all neighbors in, in all iterations. So especially for large graphs, uh, the uh, performance is not going to be great and maybe even slower than the um, sequential version, especially for sparsely connected graphs when we don't have too many edges. 
Another uh, possible implementation is what we call the matrix-based parallelization. In this case, the propagation, so the, the next frontier is obtained by doing a matrix vector multiplication. In reality, like a sparse matrix vector multiplication, this is something that we covered in the previous lecture. For um, sparsely connected graphs, something to take into account is that the connectivity matrix will be a sparse matrix, as I said, uh, we will use we will use in this case uh, a sparse matrix vector uh, multiplication. And in this uh, particular example, the matrix is like transpose. So instead of multiplying row times the um, a vector, here we do the column times vector, column times vector, column times vector. And this way we obtain these output vector that represents the output frontier. So observe that in the input frontier, this is the node. Uh, to visit while in the output frontier, these will be the node to visit. To visit. So it's the node U. Problem here is that the complexity is uh, also n square because it's uh, V plus E times L that is uh, also going to be bad for very large graphs. But this uh, type of uh, matrix space parallelization is actually um, being used in some context this and and that's uh, in context and this is what we call the linear algebraic formulation let's going to uh, let, we're going to see very quickly an example of this uh, linear algebraic formulation uh, here you have uh, the logical representation of the graph that we're going to use in the example and this is the adjacency matrix so observe that this uh, this adjacency matrix doesn't have all elements equal to one but here the elements have i mean are, might be different from one depending on what's the uh, actual weight of the corresponding edge. So in this linear algebraic formulation, uh, we typically use the vertex programming model. In the vertex programming model, we perform like several steps, uh, typically process edge, reduce, and apply. Let's see this with uh, one example. This example applies to a, a, an algorithm that is uh, uh, highly related to uh, breadth first search. It's called single source shortest path. And um, as I said before, we are going to have uh, three uh, steps. In this particular example, we also have another step that is a send message. This uh, send message is, let's say, merged with the apply step in the um, algorithm that you can uh, find in the previous slide. And the other two steps are process message and reduce. Let's see how we apply them. In reality, it's like a generalized uh, sparse matrix vector multiplication. However, um, in, in single source shortest path, we replace the multiplication and addition with uh, another so-called semi-ring that is uh, addition and minimum. So this is a original state of our algorithm. This is the uh, initial frontier because we are calculating the um, shortest paths from a particular source, in this case, node A, to all other vertices or nodes of the um, of the graph. So this is our uh, initial frontier that only contains uh, vertex A at distance um, zero. So in the uh, first iteration, what we do is uh, performing the SPMB operation using addition and minimum of uh, these uh, adjacency matrix and the uh, input frontier in order to process the message and reduce and uh, by doing the uh, SPMB operation, obtain this um, output frontier. Then um, uh, we uh, apply to the, uh, so we, comp we obtain the, we compute the minimum comparing to the previous um, um, uh, array of, uh, of labels and um, of the, over the previous uh, frontier. And we um, uh, update it, uh, as you can see uh, in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, vector here. And for the next iteration, again, we send message, which means that we uh, move this um, array of updated instances uh, here to perform, again, the SPMB operation, obtain an output array that we compare uh, to the original um, uh, input array, apply, and calculate what are the minimums. And this way, we obtain the distances from the source node that, in this case, is uh, node A to the rest of nodes uh, in the uh, graph. So as I said, this uh, linear algebraic representation is pretty useful in some contexts, but um, we are going to uh, discuss uh, another uh, technique. It's a more general technique that is um, um, 
efficient to uh, handle most uh, graph types. And one uh, good thing of this technique is that um, it uh, allows us to use specialized formulations when appropriate as an optimization. Uh, these are the uh, efficient Q-based parallel algorithms that are based on uh, two basic ideas. First of all, we are going to have a hierarchical scalable Q implementation. Second, we are going to have a hierarchical a kernel arrangement. Let's start with a simple initial attempt uh, where uh, we are going to manage the Q structure. We are going to do it with complexity uh, V plus E, which is uh, what we actually look for. Uh, but we will also see that this initial attempt has uh, some uh, important drawbacks. So uh, let's assume that our current frontier is the uh, nodes five, six, and seven. So we queue them in parallel. We have them in a queue that represents the frontier. And in this case, each node of the frontier is assigned to uh, one thread. So these three threads can perform a parallel the queue, go to the queue, go to the frontier, get one uh, frontier node, each of them, and then go to update uh, be, be, find what are the neighbors, uh, in this case, node uh, eight and node zero, and they store them in the output frontier. But if these two threads um, assigned to node six and seven try to do that at the same time, they will probably go to the uh, same element. So problem here is that because we want to enqueue uh, two elements at the same time in order to avoid data races and in order to avoid that we overwrite one of the um, output values with the other one, we have to use atomic operations and in this case, um, a store uh, in the output queue in the uh, correct way. The problem is that we are using atomic operations and that's something uh, that we know well from previous lectures. Atomic operations have a large, uh, a big problem with uh, serialization, especially if we have in this particular case, many nodes in the uh, input frontier, and we have many threads uh, working in parallel on these uh, nodes, of the, on these frontier nodes, we'll have many of them colliding, conflicting when using the atomic operations to update the output frontier. So it's uh, something that we want to uh, avoid, or at least alleviate what's its over. Um, one way of avoiding the use of atomic operations is to use these parallel insert, insert compact queues, where <laughs> first of all, we are going to uh, store the um, uh, let's say output nodes, the nodes of the output frontier um, in the frontier in a, in a um, uh, let's say, a sparse manner, because we pre-assign some uh, elements uh, in the output frontier, some positions in the output frontier to each of the nodes in the input frontier. And after that, in the uh, in, in, a, in a subsequent step, we perform a compaction in order to filter out the, let's say, empty uh, positions or empty elements of the uh, frontier. So the problem uh, with this is that the performance is not going to be great when we have like light node problems, meaning that we have to uh, reserve, uh, uh, maybe we have to reserve uh, uh, some elements for each of the um, element, or each of the nodes in the input frontier, but in the end, only few, a few positions here are going to be really useful, really containing nodes of the output frontier. So we have to perform the compaction probably on a very large array for just a very few elements. So that's why um, these parallel insert compact queues might not be uh, the best solution for uh, many different graphs. So we go back to the idea of using atomic operations, but we are going to try to optimize their use. And to do so, we can we know already one technique that is privatization, essentially consisting of creating some local results that are later merged in global results. In this particular case, in the particular case of the uh, uh, this queue structure that we are handling and the graph processing, we are going to use hierarchical queues. We will have local queues and global queues. Remember that privatization is a technique that we have discussed uh, in a previous lecture when we talked about uh, histogram calculation. Today, we are going to use it in a different context for uh, graph processing. So let's uh, take a look at what are the basic ideas here. Each thread processes one or more frontier nodes and inserts new frontier nodes into its private queues, into the local queues, uh, 
and um, and then they will have to find threats will have to find uh, their location in the global queue for the, their own uh, frontier nodes, output frontier nodes. So, for example, um, in this uh, in, in this example in this slide, we have that uh, in the first local queue we have three elements. In the second local queue, we have another three elements, node frontier nodes. Uh, in the third uh, queue, we have one. So we have to calculate what's the offset for one each of these um, local queues in order to know where to store each of these uh, elements uh, uh, of the output queue, of this local up output queue uh, in the uh, global output queue. Uh, so as you can see, what we are doing is building the queue of the next frontier hierarchically. We first create the local queues, then we merge, we concatenate these local queues uh, in the uh, global queue. So we have a two level hierarchy. We have uh, block, so in, in, in the context of the GPU, what we are going to have is block queues or B queues uh, where uh, all threads that are active in uh, a particular block are going to insert their um, output frontier nodes and that this block queue is going to reside in global memory that is fast and is accessible by all uh, threads of the block. And then we have a global queue. So after we have created the block, uh, block queues, we have to update uh, the global queue uh, by inserting the block queue in the uh, corresponding position. Problem is that we can still have, or we are going to still have collision in the block queues. We still need to use atomic operations in shared memory. Good thing is that we are applying privatization, so we are um, reducing the overhead of using the uh, atomic operations. It's true that there might be a scenarios where uh, there is uh, some contention in the access to the atomic variables, but um, it's for sure uh, a way of uh, alleviating the, the, the bigger cost of uh, creating just one single queue um, in global memory. So this uh, hierarchical queue management uh, has an advantage and a limitation. This technique can be applied to any inherently sequential data structure as long as the exact global order in between um, queue contents is not required. Observe that here in order to um, so when we have the threads of each um, uh, thread block uh, storing elements in the uh, B queue, in the block queue, they have to update a global variable that tells them where to uh, store the next uh, the output frontier node in this local queue. Um, the, the order in which these uh, atomic operations are uh, executed is not guaranteed. So that's why this um, kind of solution requires problem that can tolerate uh, the, 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 that uh, there is no uh, global ordering. And um, BQs are uh, limited by the capacity of the shared memory as well. Remember that the size of the shared memory in each streaming multiprocessor or GPU core um, is uh, relatively small. So that's clearly a limitation for the size of the uh, BQ. Um, one thing that we could do is uh, if we have some knowledge about what's the upper limit of the degree, we know what's the maximum number of neighbors that uh, each node uh, in the vertex has, we can adjust the number of threads per block accordingly to make a better use of the available shared memory, or we can have also an overflow mechanism to ensure robustness and avoid that the block queue overflow. So essentially what we will do here is a keep control on how many elements we have in queue already, how many output nodes we have in queue already uh, in the block queue. And when, 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 when we are getting close to the maximum number, um, then we uh, offload these elements or we move these elements to the global queue and then uh, we clean the local queue and then we can uh, continue with the um, uh, current iteration. And now let's discuss uh, about the kernel arrangement. Uh, we need to create global barriers uh, um, uh, for sure because we are going to have many threads in the GPU, many blocks in the GPU, each of the blocks working with their own block queue, but at some point they will have to synchronize in order to uh, say, uh, complete the global queue and start a new iteration. 
because the global queue is going to uh, contain the frontier, the input frontier of the next iteration. So we need to create global barriers. And then see, let's say default way of doing this uh, on GPUs is by uh, terminating a kernel and launching a new kernel. So in this uh, particular example, if we have an, an initial kernel call where uh, we visit the uh, nodes in the input frontier, the, the, in, in, in the very beginning, the input frontier only contains node two. Next frontier contains nodes five, six, and seven that are the neighbors of node two. But um, uh, before going to the next iteration where these nodes five, six, and seven are in the input frontier, we have to um, uh, synchronize in some way. If we have many uh, nodes in the frontier, in the input frontier, and we have to use many threads, many thread blocks, we'll have to terminate the kernel and start a new kernel. And we have to do this iteration after iteration. And this might be too much overhead for this problem, especially because in reality, there is not so much computation here. Right? So it's mostly memory accesses to visit the nodes. Uh, there is some computation to calculate indices, where, where to access, to handle the um, CSR um, uh, representation of the graph. But in reality, there is not so much computation. So though all these uh, kernel termination and relaunch might entail too much overhead uh, for uh, our problem. So there might be um, some solutions, for example, um, partially use GPU synchronization. We are going to see how uh, also we can come up with a multi-layer uh, kernel arrangement as we are going to discuss something that we mentioned uh, in the beginning of the lecture, uh, the use of dynamic parallelism is something that we are going to discuss in a later lecture. And also the last uh, possibility or the last potential solution is using persistent threads with uh, global barriers, but these global barriers are not kernel termination and relaunch, but uh, created using atomic operations. And that's something that we are going to mention very briefly explain at the very uh, end of this lecture. Before that, let's uh, talk about this um, hierarchical uh, kernel arrangement where what we do is customizing the kernels based on the size of the frontiers. And in particular, we are going to consider two possible custom kernels. First one is um, like when we have a very short zone frontiers, in this case, we can use intra-block synchronization. What we could essentially do is just launch a single thread block in the whole GPU. This, this single thread block will use its own local queue in the shared memory because we are using a single thread block or uh, threads involved in the uh, in this problem, in this iteration, can synchronize using sync threads, which is relatively fast compared to terminating the kernel. And we can do this as long as we can keep, let's say, the whole output frontier in the uh, shared memory of the GPU, but at, in the shared memory of the streaming multiprocessor. But at some point, the size of these output frontier will be too large. In that case, um, we may want to use more than one thread block so we'll have to terminate the kernel and we can start a new kernel that um, uh, uses multiple thread blocks. But every time that we want these thread blocks synchronized because they have already created the output frontier, they will have to terminate the kernel for a coarse grain synchronization and then start a new kernel. So as you see, we are going to design two different kernels. Kernel one uses intra-block synchronization, kernel two uses kernel termination and uh, relaunch. So let's first talk about the kernel one for a small size frontiers. As I said before, we only launch one thread block. These uh, working, thread, uh, working threads go level after level, iteration after iteration, visiting the nodes in the input queue, uh, creating the output queue uh, in the, uh, the BQ, in the local queue. And then this is going to be the, um, so then they will all synchronize using sync threads and the BQ will contain the uh, an input frontier for the next iteration. Again, we use as many threads as we need to process the uh, nodes in this uh, BQ and uh, propagate uh, through multiple levels every time uh, we terminate one iteration, we synchronize using sync thread and start the uh, next iteration. So here it's uh, only BQ, so we don't have to go to the global queue. It's going to be faster because we are saving global memory accesses. Problem here is that, we don't, that this only makes sense for very uh, small frontiers. When the frontier is bigger, 
we have to use the kernel tool. In this kernel tool, as I said before, we are going to terminate the kernel and relaunch a new kernel in order to um, implement the uh, synchronization. It might be, uh, let's say the overhead of relaunching the kernel might be tolerable depending on what's the size of the frontier. If the frontier is uh, very large and, and we spend quite a bit of time with multiple thread blocks processing this frontier, uh, these, uh, let's say, uh, kernel launch overhead might become uh, negligible at some point. Or we could also use uh, dynamic parallelism to launch new kernels. From the kernel one with just a single thread block, um, uh, at some point when we go oh, beyond one thread block, uh, be, sorry, beyond one threshold, uh, we will have the active threads launching new kernels to process the nodes in the output frontier. As I said, dynamic parallelism is something that we will cover in a later lecture, and we will uh, go back to um, uh, this example in the corresponding lecture. For now, we keep working with this, or we keep considering this uh, hierarchical kernel arrangement where we have two different kernels. The first kernel is like for very small frontiers we, because we are going to use a single thread block. Threads in this thread block is going to synchronize using sync threads across iterations, while in the kernel two, when we have large frontiers, we synchronize thread blocks by uh, terminating the kernel and launching a new kernel. And as we know, and as we said, the drawback of this implementation is the potential overhead of this kernel relaunch. If we want to avoid this potential overhead, one thing we can do is uh, using persistent threads and uh, using some sort of atomic operation-based interblock synchronization. We are going to see um, some examples of this. Um, we are going to propose one um, uh, implementation that uh, uses persistent threads or persistent thread blocks and essentially combines ideas from uh, kernel one and kernel two. This way, we're going to be able to avoid uh, kernel relaunch. The uh, key idea here is to use uh, persistent thread blocks. While in kernel two, what we do is um, checking what's the size of, of the frontier. And based on that, and based on the block size that we are going to use, we will launch frontier size divided by block size blocks, as um, in this example, that you can see. So this is a whole frontier. Each block is going to be responsible of one part of the frontier. So in this uh, example, we need to use M different blocks to process this frontier in the uh, persistent thread implementation that we uh, propose. What we are going to launch is the maximum number of thread blocks that can run concurrently on the GPU, which is something that will depend on the number of SMs or GPU cores that the GPU has. In this uh, toy uh, example here, we, we have two SMs only, and, and each SM can hold two thread blocks. So in total, we will be launching four thread blocks. And then when it comes to processing the frontier, even if the frontier is very long, what we do or what these thread blocks do is um, uh, uh, processing or visiting the nodes in the frontier uh, in one chunk of the frontier here, when they are done with the corresponding chunk, they go to the next free chunk of the frontier and so on and so forth. So as you can see, uh, block zero will start here, block, block one will start here with this part of the frontier and so on. When block zero visits all nodes in this part of the frontier, it will go to the next assigned chunk uh, of the frontier. Important thing here is that across iterations, We'll, we will have to synchronize because at some point these four thread blocks need to know that all other thread blocks are uh, down with the corresponding parts of the input frontier. We have already the output frontier and in order for them to see, so we need a way of the, for them to synchronize to know all of them that the whole output frontier is created before starting the next iteration. So what we can do here is um, uh, we, we, we will have as many, uh, um, uh, I mean, we, we will have multiple iterations here, depending on what are the levels uh, of this uh, graph. Um, and then um, in, in each of the iter these iterations, we have uh, the active threads, 
uh, visiting all the nodes in the frontier, but after doing so, after visiting all the nodes in the input frontier and creating the output frontier, we'll have to do some global synchronization. And there might be different ways of implementing this global synchronization using atomic operations. Here we have uh, one potential way of doing so. It's a, a simplified code, but essentially conveys the basic ideas that we um, are uh, that we need to implement this atomic based clock synchronization. So um, what uh, we have is a variable called in this particular example, uh, pointer threads n. So when one thread block finishes one uh, iteration visiting all the assigned nodes uh, of the input frontier and uh, in queuing the nodes in the output frontier, one thread of each thread block was going to um, increment this uh, atomic variable in order to mark that the corresponding thread block has finished the iteration. And then we are going to have a, a let's say, a global thread leader that is uh, called GTID equals zero. And this one, this thread is checking the same variable, this uh, PTR threads n, uh, until the uh, value in this PTR threads n is equal to the grid dim dot x, which is the dimension uh, of the grid, which is the number of uh, active thread blocks. Uh, when this happens, then it can reset the corresponding uh, atomic variable for the next iteration, and, in, and it increases these, increments this other uh, variable, pointer threads run, in order to tell all other thread blocks that they all are synchronized and they can continue with the next iteration. In the meantime, uh, the rest of uh, threads, after having updated, uh, incremented these uh, pointer threads and wait here until the, um, um, the, the, the let's say, uh, GPUY leader, GTID equals zero, has um, incremented this uh, pointer threads run. They are checking here, and if this pointer threads run is equal to the iteration number, and after that they can continue. Observe that uh, all the rest of threads, those that are not don't have uh, thread ID equals zero, uh, will have to wait here uh, in, in these uh, sync threads. And this is uh, one way of uh, implementing this global synchronization, and um, uh, essentially can be useful to synchronize all active thread blocks, uh, persistent thread blocks, uh, without having to terminate the kernel and uh, start a new kernel. And this uh, idea or this way of uh, synchronizing can be using uh, many other iterative problems. For example, we have used it in uh, segmentation in medical image analysis. Uh, segmentation is essentially an operation to obtain the area of an organ, a tumor or um, uh, uh, vessels, et cetera. Here you can see some examples of vessel segmentation, liver segmentation, and tumor uh, segmentation. Uh, one, there are different algorithms to perform this segmentation, but a popular one is called uh, seeded region growing. Um, it's an iterative algorithm where we have dynamic data structure as the region grows and they say the default way of uh, implementing this region growing is by uh, terminating the kernel and launching a new kernel. Observe that here in the end, it's kind of similar. We, 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 have, we have an initial seed and from this seed, we start checking what are the uh, pixels around, around the seed. Um, if they belong to the tissues that we are looking for, for example, the organ or the tumor that we are looking for. Uh, so in the end, it's same as creating a frontier as we do in, in, in graph processing in the BFS problem. If we are using multiple thread blocks, we need to a way of synchronizing these thread blocks after performing, uh, uh, after terminating each iteration. We could use kernel termination and relaunch or we could use an atomic based uh, interblock synchronization. That is something that we uh, did and uh, obtained uh, very good uh, performance results thanks to this technique. And these are some papers where you can uh, check well, how we have used uh, these um, ideas for image segmentation or medical image segmentation. And another uh, interesting, um, let's say, uh, ideas that we can uh, 
relate to graph processing are based on collaborative implementation. Observe that these uh, dynamic data structure, uh, structure might be pretty regular in graph processing. Uh, we have that different nodes have different number of neighbors. We may have nodes with uh, very few neighbors. We may have nodes with many, many neighbors. That's um, the same as um, if you think about the graph representing a social network, for example, there might be users who have only, uh, say, a, a dozen of friends, while there might be uh, other users that have millions of friends or followers. So depending on what's the current iteration where we are processing, when we are processing a graph, we may have a small or large frontiers. And actually, one thing that we observe in an um, heterogeneous parallel platform, like an NVIDIA Jetson uh, TX1 containing um, CPU and also a small GPU, um, one thing we observe is that depending on what's the frontier size, the CPU or the GPU might be faster. Observe that in the very initial uh, iterations, very initial frontiers, and also in the final iterations or final frontiers, where we have typically shorter uh, frontiers, we uh, see that the CPU is faster than the GPU and only um, in the, uh, let's, say, let's say, bulk of the graph where we have many more nodes uh, in the frontier, we start observing or you know, we start seeing that the uh, GPU is uh, significantly faster than the CPU. So one thing we could do is uh, coming up with uh, this collaborative implementation where we choose CPU or GPU, depending on what's the size of the frontier. We are going to establish some threshold or some limit and we launch CPU thread or GPU or a GPU kernel, depending on what's the size of the frontier. And the CPU threads or the GPU kernel can keep running while the condition is satisfied. In the GPU implementation, we would use something like the um, persistent kernel, um, thread blocks with the um, atomic base uh, interblock synchronization. And this way, we don't have to terminate the kernel. Uh, here, you can see just some experimental results for just two graphs. Um, we are, uh, these are normalized, this normalized execution time to the CPU only version. And as you can see, the say, collaborative implementation that uses either CPU or GPU for this particular graph is like 15% faster than the GPU only version. And in the worst case well, for uh, an implementation like this, um, if the nodes or the frontiers are uh, usually uh, larger, uh, or, or pretty large, let's say, um, we are going to mostly use the GPU. So in the end, the performance is not really worse for the collaborative implementation. We will talk about uh, collaborative algorithms in a later lecture as well. We will probably go back uh, over this example of um, BFS, of uh, graph processing. So uh, I will uh, remind you these ideas in, in, in the corresponding lecture. Meantime, if you want to keep learning about uh, graph processing, graph algorithms, graph search, take a look at chapter 12 of the Programming Massively Parallel Processors book. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope to see you in a later lecture.